Good evening, everyone, and, uh, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the second installment for September of the, uh, the Alcuin Society's uh, virtual le lectures. And thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, uh, to attend this evening's uh, conversation and presentation around uh, Andre Chavez and his work with uh, Clinker Press. Um, for, for this evening's proceedings, uh, we are going to be doing it in three parts. So there's going to be a section at the beginning um, that will be an introduction done by Peter High. We will then go through and, uh, and, and watch a, a, a video that was put together by Andre, which is a tour of his, of his workshop. And then we will uh, we'll go into uh, uh, questions and, and conversation uh, at the end of the, the video. And if you have any questions that come up while you're watching uh, the video, please feel free to, uh, to put it in the chat. And, um, and we will be able to, I'm seeing uh, no audio. Are, are people able to hear me now? Peter, can you hear me? Excellent. Well, so what we'll do is just to begin with, um, seeing some new names for, for the registration of, uh, of this evening. And so I thought I'd take the opportunity just to let people know about you know, what the Alcuin Society is. Uh, my name's Spencer Stewart and, and I'm, the, uh, I'm the, uh, the chairman of the board for the Alcuin Society. And you know, the, the Alcuin Society, it began in 1965. And it is, uh, it's the only nonprofit organization in Canada that's dedicated to the entire range of interests relating to books and reading. Uh, M4, which is the society's journal published three times a year, uh, covers a whole variety of topics, including authorship, publishing, book design, uh, history of the book, libraries, ephemera, book selling, really the, the list is, is endless, uh, calligraphy, illustration. Uh, to further our aims, the Alcuin Society has a wide range of educational activities that it engages in. So lectures, workshops, uh, exhibitions, field visits. Um, this virtual series is really a sort of extension of, of, of uh, goals and, and objectives that we've had in the past. The Alcuin Society annual awards for excellence in book design in Canada is the only national competition of its kind that recognizes and celebrates the art of book design in Canada. Uh, winners of this award represent uh, the nation at the international exhibition and competition at both Frankfurt and Leipzig book fairs, uh, which is held annually. The society also offers the Robert R. Reed Award and medal to recognize lifetime achievement uh, in and around extraordinary contributions to the book arts in Canada. And that's, um, that's also given out um, on an occasional basis. If you, uh, if you are not a member of the society, we encourage you to visit our site uh, and, uh, and become a member today. Uh, I, I'll be putting the, uh, the link in the chat if, uh, if you're curious to, uh, to have a look further. Um, before we go further, I, I would like to thank uh, Gina Page for uh, organizing the, uh, the programming of the virtual series. Uh, really, all of this could not have been done without her and her, her connections with, with the various people that are uh, speaking for this series. So um, many thanks to her and her work with, uh, with programming for the Alcuin Society. So as I mentioned, we'll be going uh, in three parts. And uh, we'll be moving over now to uh, Peter High, who will give an introduction to Andre and his connections with uh, Andre's practice and, and the Clinker Press. We'll then go into a, uh, a watching the, the video, which is the tour of his workshop. And then we'll open on into a conversation and, and questions uh, at the end of the, uh, the video. And again, if you have any questions for Andre, please uh, feel free to uh, to put them in the chat and uh, we'll be sure to get to them uh, at, when we get to that point. So without further ado, I will, I'm going to bring Peter up here. All right, and your sound is good, Peter. 
Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Spencer and Gina. One of the many pleasures of owning a bookshop is meeting people from many places and walks of life, readers, browsers, scholars, writers, collectors, and bibliophiles, people of all sorts and yet of one kind, united in the great universal fellowship of the books. You meet hundreds, perhaps thousands of people over the course of a year, learn about their tastes and talk about their interests. And if you're lucky, a few of these casual visitors will turn very gradually into regular customers and eventually a very, very few of them into your friends. Andre Chavez and his wife, Anne, lived a stroll from our first bookshop that my wife, Dorothea, and I started in an alley in the old part of Pasadena, California, which, which was just coming back to life after a devastating earthquake in 1989. Their main interest lay with the arts and crafts movements of the late 19th and early 20th century. As we found out gradually, um, their, this interest extended way beyond books. They lived at that time in one of the green and green masterpieces of Pasadena's bungalow district. Anne is a textile artist who embroidered her own variations of Art Nouveau designs and gave workshops at the Gamble House, the most famous creation of the Green Brothers, where she was also a docent. Both Andre and Anne were also active members of the Zamorano Club, the Los Angeles Bibliophile Society that closely resembles our own. When they invited us into their house and home, we found ourselves transported into a temple of the arts and crafts, where not only the books on the bookshelves, but all the furniture, including the lamps and fixtures, the decorations and their frames, the table settings and cushions, all formed a harmonious whole. Anne and Andre met in upstate New York, still in high school, where Andre came as an exchange student from Brazil. That school was in East Aurora, a historic village in New York State where Albert Hubbard established the influential Roy Croft workshops, and not so very far from Syracuse, where Gustav Stickley produced his famous furniture and spread the arts and crafts credo through his magazine, The Craftsman. It was this background and sensibility that they brought with them when they moved west to Southern California. By chance, another customer at our bookshop had acquired a couple of tabletop hand presses used mainly for printing cards and labels. Dan Reed was a tinkerer and amateur enthusiast, and he persuaded us and a few friends with interest in the book arts to try out these presses. Our shop was small with every surface covered with books, so we welcomed an invitation to move our printing course to the garage attached to that splendid kingdom of the arts and crafts where Anne and Andre ruled. Here we would meet Sunday mornings to try and set single lines of type, get our hands dirty, but mainly to talk about books and consume delicious refreshments baked by Anne, who would sit in on our sessions and keep her hands busy embroidering. This went on for a few months, I think, and then the emphasis began to shift from doing to just talking and we moved the meetings from the garage into the house, closer to the coffee and the cookies. Eventually, the group fell apart. We were all very busy, and some, actually myself, found out that I was hopeless with setting type or handling the simplest of machines. So we went our ways, but not without having left behind a seed planted in Andre's mind. Here, it's worth mentioning that professionally, Andre was the busiest amongst us all. As a popular hand surgeon, he was commuting between three clinics in the sprawling Los Angeles basin, operating 
and mending hands and bones, including my wife's, who managed to break both her wrists in, on two separate occasions. Gradually, Andre began to rearrange his garage, acquiring odd pieces of equipment, types, and cabinets, which were to be had in spades during the 1990s, when many traditional printers switched to digital typesetting and printing. Meanwhile, Anne and Andre moved houses a couple of times, where they created increasingly larger spaces to accommodate the growing collection of presses and other printing paraphernalia. It was still a hobby which Andre pursued with the enthusiasm of a true amateur, constantly learning and trying out new machines and techniques. Finally, they moved up to the Portland area to be closer to their children and grandchildren. Having retired from medicine, Andre devotes most of his energy now to designing and printing books, broadsheets, and ephemera, including one that he produced for Alcuin to mark this occasion. And you can see some of them in the background here, which I put up about nine of them. An accomplished artist, he draws most of the illustrations himself, even when the image could be reproduced mechanically from a printed source. He also gives talks frequently during the Craftsman Weekend in Pasadena and at the Arts and Crafts Conference in Asheville, North Carolina, where Andre and Anne exhibit their works each year. The short film he prepared for us today will give you just a taste of his wide interests. And after this brief tour of his printing studio in Oregon, he'll be happy to answer some of your questions. So without further ado, it is my privilege to present for your pleasure, my friend and a true Renaissance man, Dr. Andre Chavez. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, for putting that together and being able to, to set that up as a, uh, as a kind of pretext for, for your practice. Um, let's see if we have some questions that maybe we can, uh, we can go to right off the bat. I, I have some as well, but we can, uh, let's see. Okay, so we, we have a question here that just came in. Um, how, how do printers view designers such as uh, Tal and Morris? Um, the relationship between the two professions, love, hate, or, or love, love? Well, that's an issue that happens in the arts and crafts movement in general, not specifically in printing. Um, there, there is something about the method. I think a good printer should enjoy the process of printing. Whether he comes up with the ideas and the designs and prints himself or herself is less important. If you don't like the process, I don't care whose design it is, you're gonna hate what you're doing and what's the point of printing. I have uh, used occasionally designs by, by others, but it is always more difficult to understand what they want if they don't know the limitations of uh, letterpress printing. Uh, nowadays, uh, people are so used to the computer that is easy for them to say, could you reprint this in a lighter color? Well, I have to reprint the whole thing. I have to clean the press and put the ink back in it. Uh, some years ago, I had a group of graphic designers uh, come visit the, the press. It was very enlightening to me. When they saw on, on the table uh, the pages that was getting ready to print, they said, Wow, so how did you choose the typeface? I said, well, you know, I knew a little bit about the typeface and this typeface I used. And they coyly said, well, what if you don't like it? <laughs> I said, if you don't like it, you have to do it all over again. The younger graphic designers, uh, as talented as they are, work differently. It's a reaction. They put the text up, I like it. No, I don't like it. Uh, Caslon. Caslon comes up. Uh, no, Garamond. Garamond comes up. Uh, I'm going to drop an initial here. No, bigger initial. The computer adapts to it. So 
it is a reaction. They, they look at it as I like it or I don't like it. And not that they don't have knowledge, but it is a reaction rather than a uh, in a letterpress printing. You have to know ahead of time what you're doing. Mm. You can change it, but it's a lot of work to, to change once you set a book. Um, Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I feel I feel that um, you know this this kind of drives into a question that I had for you in in, in looking at your work and 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 seeing it over the years. Um, What's the process by which you select your the text that you're going to make a book around or a keepsake around? How, wh walk us through that process. Is it one that you find is, is there a method to it or is it something that happens more organically? I, I think you can say that it's more organic. I tell people that I read probably 30% of what I read looking for something to print. I'm reading to see, is this something I want to reproduce? Sometimes it is an image that comes up associated with a subject and then I have to find a source or, or a better source and print with that image. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, there is one project that I'm working on, which is a visit to the Dove's Bindery. Well, the Dove's Bindery, of course, was before the Dove's Press. And this is a woman who went to England and uh, kind of apprenticed with him, something that he didn't do, he didn't like apprentices. And she came back a couple of times and uh, wrote something of the period. She did go on to uh, have her uh, bookbinding uh, business in New York City, uh, apprentice also with a famous uh, bookbinder in Paris, I forget his name. And she was on to be very successful. And then she dies at 33 years of age. Mm. She had the elephant bindery. I don't know why the, the, the name. But again, this is something that I just ran across. And I thought, I, I always like these biographies that are of the period. You know, she lived it. She was there. She went to visit him and wrote about it. And uh, everybody knows about the Dove's Press. They know a little less about the Dove's bindery. Uh, other times, uh, I have had uh, people call me to, to print. I mentioned three books that I printed from contemporary writers. And the subject has to interest me. You know, I, I, I don't say that I print books for an olive. Uh, if it is a subject that uh, is into the printing to the arts and crafts world, then it catches my attention. And that's another way that I produce books. Uh, you, you were talking about this this intriguing idea of uh, you know the the arts and craft movement in, in the UK and the way in which it develops in a very sort of tight social group and then the kind of disparate um, variations on the theme that you see in the United States. Um, mm. With regards to your you know your own practice in, in Pasadena and your move up to Oregon, have you have you felt a, a somewhat of a change in terms of the, the print scenes from where you were in Pasadena up into uh, your your uh, your your new projects up in Oregon? Is there has there been some is there still sort of regional feels that you that you perceive um, from you know that beginning period of the arts and crafts movement? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. L.A. Of course, everybody has an opinion of L.A., but one thing that I find very true. Because LA is a city of layers. You can go to LA and say, I'm going to Disneyland. That's fine. There's a certain layer that you go to Disneyland Universal Studios. But uh, I think most people know that most of the writers, literature people, are from LA, not New York City. Mm. Uh, if you are looking for something in LA, you will find someone who does whatever it is you're looking for. And he's going to be very good at it. Uh, so the source of material is a lot, a lot easier. When I moved to, uh, to Portland, uh, and of course, Portland, Rain, Powell Bookshop, and I talked to Michael from Powell's, said, wow, well, you know, there's a lot of book collectors here. He said, nope, nope, very few book collectors. They read, but they're not book collectors. Uh, the uh, Himes and Dunaway, which is uh, a small group here, is small, 
you know, it's no comparison with the Zamorano Club, which I was a part of in, in LA. Uh, so there is a big difference. Uh, the horizons in LA are very open. Here are kind of closed in, mm. but but cozy. I also uh, always said that LA, with that weather, it's, it doesn't it doesn't appeal to introspection. You want to be out there. You want to go out to do things. Uh, I think the uh, climate here really supports more introspection, mm. and that's what I'm noticing here. It's mm. nice to sometimes on a cloudy day, can I go to my printing shop and kind of just lose myself in it. Mm. Um, I was thinking what I, what I would do now is, is, bring, uh, is bring Peter back into the conversation uh, to, to if he has any questions or uh, uh, any, any additional comments to make. Um, Peter, if you want to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, this um, mm -hmm. exercise uh, made me go through all the ephemera and books that I have from Clinker Press. And it's an amazing number of items. And uh, I don't know whether, I, did you mention once, uh, Andre, that uh, someone is doing a, a list of them, a bibliography or anything? Or is that waiting for me? <laughs> I think it's waiting for you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But no, no one is, uh, is doing a bibliography of Glinka Press. I think it's really, it would be really important, especially for the ephemera, uh, because there are so many of them, so many wonderful pieces. And uh, uh, maybe when we donate our collection to Simon Fraser, we can, mm -hmm. I, I'll do a bibliography of it and with your help about uh, the dates and so on, and maybe a bit of notes on it and so on. Yeah, I'm pretty good about putting the dates on it. So the dates, I think, will be easier to uh, to come by. And there was one Zebrano Club member who was uh, doing that and would call me as the size of the uh, keepsakes. I don't think that project ever came to fruition. So. Um, I, I think. Yeah, sorry. Oh no, I just had a, I just had a thought about um, you know you you were having a, this this conversation about. Uh, the reception of, of typography. And it, it brought to mind a, an experiment that was carried out a, a couple of years back now by Earl Morris, and I believe it was through the New York Times, in which he took a body of text, which was uh, to do with, uh, I think, the orbiting of the sun, but it was completely off. But they used different typefaces um, from, you know, Baskerville being the more kind of read as the authoritative type. You're talking about this kind of reactionary relationship to text. It's like this kind of knee-jerk reaction. And they moved it through to, to Comic Sans. And I always thought that this had kind of an idea of the, the, the context within which you receive type. Mm -hmm. um, what are some what are some thoughts about about the process of of making books or or keepsakes and how might that play into the the moment of someone receiving the work that you make? Yeah, that I think addresses some of the criticisms that typographers have uh, uh, made about if you if you printing a book of the eighteen hundreds you're not supposed to put an ornament is from the sixteen hundreds. But then if you go back to uh, Gutenberg, who, who was he printing from? What was the source? Well, we know that it was uh, in a sense the manuscripts, but printing printers ornaments were, were created just to illustrate the, uh, the page, not for a specific point in time. Mm -hmm. So there is no such a thing. Uh, aesthetically, there is. I think from design standpoint, I can put an ornament. So what do you think of that? So boy, that looks it's old looking versus a very modern ornament. Yeah, there is such a thing. And if you put a, a Landacre print in a 1600 text, it would look awkward. Uh, but typefaces, just to bring maybe a related subject up, you go to typography books and there is this uh, old and new and transition typefaces, right? And you see the, the definition 
And the old, uh, old uh, typefaces are a little heavier. The little typefaces, they claim, are very thick and, and thin and stuff. So they have all this description. You take it out of there and you show to someone interested in, in, in books and reading, but not really a typographer, they could probably tell no difference between them. In addition, <laughs> the old style typefaces are 99% designed by 20th century typographers. You know, they say, is, is a Garamond. Who's Garamond? People don't even know exactly what Garamond designed. Caslon, a little bit more. We know more about Caslon. But the Caslons, I have a Caslon uh, put out by Intertype and one by Linotype, and they're a little different. Did Caslon made a different typeface? No, we did. We interpreted that and modified. So the historicity of what typeface it is, I think, to me, becomes more aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Does it look odd? And not, am I going to print a modern poetry with Gothic letters? Yeah, that would be a little unusual. Although I did hear a comment. Uh, it wasn't particularly modern, but it was not, you know, old English stuff. But he printed in old English and said, and someone said, but this is difficult to read. And the guy says, exactly. I want people to take their time to read it. So you can use something historically inaccurate with a purpose. That's what you want to do. But I think mostly is the, the aesthetics of it. Uh, there's a comment that uh, Randall Gaffner made in the, in the chat that I think is, is worth, worth bringing up here is, uh, um, I believe I noticed a, a theme throughout the value of community and connections in Pasadena for Clinker Press, the value of community at the Red House for Morris, and then the potential downside of arts, the arts and crafts movement for Stickley and Hubbard, who you report lived close to each other, but did not extend their communities to intermingle. Um, you know, I think that is, a, that's, you know, you think of even Peter, the, your introduction today about Clinker Press and, and the way in which it all came around a, a group of friends uh, is, is, you know, not to be overlooked, such an important aspect of it, I think. Yes, and, and for instance, uh, here in Portland, where the, there are a number of letterpress printers, but something curious happened in the 70s, um, something called, I don't want to go there too much, but art books. Uh, art books were designed by graphic arts in universities, and uh, they were not really letterpress printers. So what did they do? Well, they used a vendor cook press, and I mentioned in my presentation, is a very easy press to use. And they saved these presses. And most of the other presses were going for scrap. And they saved the presses because it was easy to use. It was not dangerous, very difficult to hurt yourself in a, you know, a crank uh, vendor cook press. So now these presses are still around because they are easy to use. Nowadays, it is not uncommon to see $15,000 as a price tag on a single vendor cook press. But they caused a lot of people to do their own little thing, cards and invitations and so on, without knowing much letterpress printing. And that was a positive and a negative. When I got here, uh, there was immediately one, one uh, letterpress show and I went to the press and I brought my, all my books and I put the books out there. No one else had any books. Mm. They all have cards and things like that, but no one is printing books. Printing, printing a book is, is something, I don't know, completely different. Uh, you have the subject and you, 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 you know, set the type and you put the illustrations and so on. Even after you print and you see the, the, the sheets, but then you send it to the binder. When it comes back with a cover bound, that is the first time that as a printer, I see what the book is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. You have an idea, but you don't know that. Mm -hmm. And I try to convey to these people, I'll print a book, even if it's a, a booklet, even a booklet, when you see it all together, it's something different than printing an invitation. Mm -hmm. But I find that a lot of letterpress printers here are not interested in, in books necessarily. Mm. Well, we have a, we're, we're 
reaching the top of the hour, but there's a there's a question that I'd, I'd like to like to uh, present to you here, uh, and it's a uh, person here says your reaction to Rogers Printer's flowers was a surprise. Uh, is your feeling about it due to perhaps uh, mechanical use of pre-made pieces? And you'd rather see art illustrations used instead for the same purposes? Or um, wh what was your sort of uh, your, your sentiments towards that? More because he did so much of that. Not that it isn't valuable and boy, the one that I put up is not the most complicated one. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I mean, if you try to do that, it's so delicate, so difficult to keep the alignment, keep the alignment of, of type is a little bit difficult. Ornaments are, you know, if you notice the ornaments are 45 degrees and are straight, are vertical, uh, they're very difficult. So it isn't so much the criticism that he used ornaments, others have used ornaments and it's fine. Uh, but he stopped doing what he did initially. You know, he, he did more illustration and then almost abandoned that. The altar book later, later work, I think he came back a little bit to it, but uh, the twenties, most of the work is, you know, it's rather boring. And at the same time, that you see uh, book covers with beautiful illustrations. So the commercial people were not paying attention to these typographers. They were doing their own thing. And uh, some of the covers are fantastic, but title pages, not so much. Mm. They're elegant, they call them. This is very elegant. I mean, it's very simple. It's a title, a little a floral on, and the, the, the author, and that's it. Uh, I think they had the, the ability to do more than what they did. Hmm. Um, maybe perhaps a, a sort of a parting question is, uh, what, uh, what do we have to look forward to with the clinker press? So what are some ideas that you have on the horizon that, that you can share at this moment that, uh, that you're looking forward to working on? Well, I have a very interesting project I was mentioning to Peter the other day. Uh, Kim Stafford was the uh, poet laureate of Oregon a couple of years ago, and he is a man who is everywhere. And he respects and, and likes and gets involved with the uh, Native Americans and uh, someone from Berkeley is going to write a poem in one of the dialects. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lawton Kennedy, printed a book in the 50s about the Jesuit press. The Jesuits were here before Zamorano and they had a press and they printed a number of things, nothing fantastic, but a number of things. And it so happens that uh, the Oregon uh, uh, history, what is it, the Oregon Historic Society has the press. And so we contacted them and said, Kim Stafford asked, would you print the cover on that press? And I said, well, I was thinking a wood press, gee, it's gonna be a difficult problem, but I'll find out. Well, they showed me a picture. And in fact, it's a, if you imagine those hand presses of the, the, the 1800s, except that it's very small and mounted on wood, but is a metal press. So I think there'll be no problem printing with it. So. Tomorrow we're going to, uh, to see it. It's on a permanent exhibit. I don't know how much access we're gonna have, but we're, we're gonna see it. Um, there is a, a brayer there falling apart. I said, don't worry, we can use another brayer. But <coughs> I was thinking of printing the, the poetry that he is talking about and uh, Clinker Press will say, well, here's the story of printing with this press. Uh, I'll go back to Lawton Kennedy's book and see, give some more information. I print a little something about using the press. So that's what is currently right, hot, hot item. So that's that's fresh. That's tomorrow. You're off to uh, to get get rolling on. That, well, that's that's really exciting. Um, thank you both uh, for taking the time. Thank you for putting together the uh, the video, the tour. Um, 
we we will have that that's still on the the Alcuin YouTube site so um or on the uh yeah our YouTube channel so if you'd like to return to it and take a look at more details um uh, you're more than welcome uh we will be also putting up this conversation uh later probably about a week and um a couple couple of other things to to announce uh, we're we're finished for obviously for September but we have an upcoming uh series of talks for October uh the first one is going to be addition binding a conversation and that will be a conversation with book designer Francis Hunter and bookbinder Alana Simeonson and that's going to be taking place October 14th at uh 5 p.m. uh Pacific time and so uh it's already uh you can already sign up for that and uh and uh, we look forward to it and again thank you both Andre Andre and uh and Peter for putting together this presentation and um and and all the best to everyone and thank you again for for stopping by and uh and uh hopefully you have a chance to take a look at the Alcuin Society and 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 consider becoming a member. Excellent. Thanks Spencer. <clears throat> thank you all. Have a good evening. You thank too. you. Thank have you. <clears throat>